Bayonetta. Bayonetta. Two is good. That's it. You, you can leave now. No other game encapsulates just this amount of fun and pure joy, making Bayonetta 2 a staple in the hack and slash genre. I never played Bayonetta 2 when it first came out because it was on a console that everyone had. We're taking a look at the Nintendo Switch version, so... Let's dance, boys! Bayonetta 2 was helmed by Yusuke Hashimoto, producer of Bayonetta 1, with Hideki Kamiya taking a supervisory role because he was busy blocking people on Twitter. Mari Shimazaki returns for the character redesigns, making what I think is the definitive look of Bayonetta. So the first game was published by notoriously reliable game company Sega in 2009. Therefore, Platinum Games signed on again to make Bayonetta 2 with their old friends. However, for reasons unknown, Sega decided they wanted to cut back on the amount of projects they were developing. They quickly sought out many publishers, all rejecting the project due to its scale. Isn't over. Until family-friendly game company Nintendo swooped in and offered to fund the remainder of the project. They even offered additional support to help finish it. Fans, of course, calmly voiced their concerns about Nintendo ruining their beloved title with micromanaging and censorship. I mean, she's introduced Crotch first. Nintendo actually insisted that they make the game sexier? Platinum made the game they wanted to make and Nintendo made it happen. Bayonetta 2 was released on September 20th in Japan and October 24th everywhere else exclusively for the Wii U. Bayonetta more or less defines hack and slash combat. You've got four guns you can fire just to keep your score going, as well as a punch and kick you can combine into dozens of different moves. Some combos summon your wicked weaves, demons from Inferno that do massive damage. You can visit Rodan's store, the gates of hell, to unlock various new techniques and accessories that drastically affect gameplay, such as the Moon of Mahakala, a parry ability that turns the game into MGR. Alongside all of that, after you nimbly dodge an attack at the last second, you enter Witch Time, where time slows down and the damage you deal is increased. This time around, you get a bunch of new weapons that are actually fun to use. Standouts being Alruna, a pair of whips that can toss enemies around which really helps with crowd control, and Chernabog, a triple-bladed scythe with the God of Death's soul trapped inside. The game is split into multiple chapters, each chapter having mandatory and optional encounters in which you get graded. You might think, oh look, I got a gold, good for me, only to realize there's two more medals above that. Optional encounters appear as portals to Muspelheim, challenges you could take for bonus rewards. Bayonetta never disappoints when it comes to enemy encounters. Not only are you putting the fear of god into angels, demons make an appearance, changing things up from set piece to set piece. I always found Bayonetta enemy design weird as hell. Just these giant stone baby faces mushed together with armor and limbs are so distinct and unlike anything else. Enemy attacks for the most part are well telegraphed with a visual flash, while the audio element has been more or less removed. The entire game is a lot more colorful than its predecessor as well as having a lighter tone and more over the top action. There's always something happening in this game. You go from fighting a dragon on a skyscraper to a mech suit to a frickin' kaiju battle. This game just doesn't let up and delivers on all accounts. It comes with this uh, co-op mode called um, Tag Climax, where you and another player can take on challenge rooms online. Or on the couch. Here I am with my friend, CPU. You can revive each other and even do combos together with separate loadouts. And that's it, there's nothing left to talk about. Not Umbran Climax occurs when Bayonetta's magic meter is full and she goes Super Saiyan. It functions more or less like the Devil Trigger in the Devil May Cry series. Bayo begins to regenerate health and every attack is a screen clearing wicked weave. Umbran Climax sort of splits the fan base. It's overpowered and available too frequently. But Sheriff. Why don't you just not use it? Bayonetta 2 overemphasizes the wicked weaves in Witch Time. Basic weapons deal a pitiful amount of damage and the final score is heavily weighted towards your clear time. 
Most bosses are, more or less, invulnerable outside of witch time, making a perfect dodge than spamming the same wicked weave combo the only viable option. Or just sitting back during Umbrian Climax and seeing everything cease to exist. Playing Bayonetta for the plot is kind of like playing Bayonetta for the plot. The game starts off with Bayonetta in her Sunday best out for a Christmas shop, making this game tied with the Addams Family as the best Christmas and Halloween piece of media. She's accompanied by Enzo, the small Italian Joe Pesci from the first game. Then John shows up and warns Bayonetta about the angels acting up. Then this happens. Rodan shows up, dressed as Santa Claus, throws Bayo some new guns, and then leaves. During the battle, one of Bayonetta's summons breaks loose and kills Jean. Her soul is then dragged to Inferno. In order to bring her back, Bayo needs to find Jean in Inferno and place her Umbran watch on her chest. But in order to go to Hell, she needs to find the gates of Hell, which are located in the sacred mountain called Fimbleven. Bayo arrives in this beige village and finds this annoying kid called Loki. More on him later, with the best British accent I've ever heard. These punches don't know which way. Shite. Damn it. Oi! Whatever, love. He too is trying to get to the gates in Fimble Venter, but she doesn't know how. Luca is here too. Bring me chili fries! Meanwhile, a mysterious Lumen Sage and an even more mysterious man in a poncho plot to stop Bayo and Loki from getting to the gate. Lumen Sage shows up and you beat his ass. Later on, the poncho guy, his name is Lopter, like Kelly Lopter, shows up and opens Bayo's mind to show her a memory from 500 years ago. There she sees her daddy, Balder, bad guy from the first game, didn't kill her mom Rosa, but a kid who looks exactly like Loki did. So Bayo continues protecting the kid from Balder, I mean Lumen Sage. Loki opens up the gates of Inferno and Bayo jumps in. There she meets up with Rodan and frees Jean from the demoness Alrone, then proceeds to escape Inferno. The Lumen Sage shows up again and it's revealed that it's young Balder. Loki does some magic and Bayo is transported 500 years into the past during the witch hunt where she fights alongside her mummy. Here she finds Loki's doppelganger and it's young Lopter. Okay, this is where things get complicated. So three worlds came into existence, light, darkness, and chaos, or paradise from Inferno and Earth, respectively. The god of chaos, Aesir, decided to give humanity free will by splitting the eyes of the world, his eyes, into the left eye of darkness and the right eye of light. The left eye went to the Umbran witches while the right eye went to the Lumen Sage. Balder and Rosa possessed the two eyes until Rosa died and the left eye went to Bayonetta. Now when Aesir split his eyes, he also split himself, becoming two halves of pure evil and pure good. That's who Lopter and Loki are. Now, Lopter wants to take the eyes back so he he can take over the world or some shit. Lopter takes the eyes from Bayo and Balder and becomes Aesir. So Loki destroys both eyes, rendering Lopter powerless, and then this happens.
However, Lopter's not done. His soul remains and he threatens to go back in time and try again. So Balder absorbs his soul, preventing Lopter from being reborn, and that's why he's evil in the first game. Bay and John call it a day and go shopping. We check in on everyone else and... Let's dance, boys! And that's Bayonetta 2, one of the best... But Sheriff, the game cannot be that good, there has to be something wrong with it. Like how it's designed for filthy casuals and how spamming a single move is a viable tactic for beating the game. The game is a lot more forgiving than the previous title. Where in the last game, you'd fight like a literal god only to get a stone trophy. In this game, you can suck as much as you do and still manage to sneak a silver. All the new weapons play differently and have different effects, but admittedly the moveset, techniques, items, and accessories are identical to the last game. But what changes is, the lock on button is swapped with the change weapon button, so you can stay locked on and dodge incoming attacks. They cut out the on-rail shooting sections and instant death, quick time events. Items no longer incur a penalty. Okay, hear me out. Yes, there aren't that many differences between the two games other than minor quality of life improvements and depending on who you ask, worst combat balancing. My question to you, viewer, is how much do you care? What's the issue? It's too similar to Bayonetta, one of the best hack and slash games ever made. The sequel doubles down with more colorful environments, more bombastic set pieces. It makes the first seem boring and tame in comparison. Bayonetta 2, for me, will always be the definitive Bayonetta experience, and nothing will ever change that. Well, except for Bayonetta 3, which is not out yet as of time of recording. Ceresa, just one time. Call me... Daddy. Daddy. Thank you, Ceresa.